Welcome. <laughs> Greetings. It's Christina Passioni Zayas checking in here at Erickson Institute. I'm the Director of Policy, and it's my pleasure to co host this webinar with Dr. Cynthia Tate, Executive Director from the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. Welcome, Cynthia. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for um, allowing me to co host with you, and I'm very excited about. Uh, this report and the uh, opportunity it presents for Illinois. So during today's webinar, we're going to orient you to the risk and reach report, um, the website. We're going to preview that and we're going to highlight some key messages and spend some time answering your questions. Given that we started late, um, we will go a little bit beyond um, depending on how much time we can fit this in. Um, but I want to also note that we're recording the webinar, so you'll be able to catch it if you do have to sign off at one o'clock. Um, as I mentioned before, I'd like for you to submit your questions through the chat box, and we will address them at the end. And so, moving along here, I um, want to get us started. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the partners who lent their expertise to produce this report. Um, the Illinois Early Childhood Asset Map, or ICAM, at the University of Illinois, uh, was our data partner for the risk and reach portion of the report. And the Fiscal Policy Center from Voices for Illinois Children uh, was the data partner for the fiscal scan. And I'm delighted that our colleagues who comprise the core partners are joining us on the webinar and will be available for the Q&A session. I've got Mitch Lifson from Voices, the Vice President of Policy and Operations here with us at Erickson. And we also have uh, Dr. Don Thomas, Principal Investigator, and Dr. Eric Wang, the Data Project Manager from ICANN, calling in. I also want to acknowledge our funders. Um, the Irving Harris Foundation con convened several foundations to make this project possible. As you can see here, the Prisker Children's Initiative, the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, and the W. Clement and Jesse V. Stone Foundation joined in and were able to make this project possible. And I want to also just acknowledge that this wasn't just um, a, an effort of the core partners, but I want to acknowledge our advisory council of 40 plus stakeholders representing public and private sectors across the state. They, along with roughly 60 other stakeholders, provided feedback to ensure that the report would be relevant, timely, and accessible to ultimately meet the overarching goal for the information to be actionable. We've been committed to ensuring that all children have equitable opportunities to realize their fullest potential. And that commitment includes being a collaborator, like in projects like this, essentially to produce Illinois' first ever risk and reach report, which is a comprehensive map of the state's early childhood resources and needs um, what I want to do is move us along here then, because you can access this video on our um, website. It's a quick, like I said, two-minute video that gives you an overview of the risk and reach report. Um, and essentially what this report is designed to do is to gain a deeper understanding with a level of precision that doesn't exist today. Essentially, what's happening with our youngest children? And we're defining our youngest children age five and under. And so for the first time ever, you're going to be able to see how we are doing in Illinois, county by county, with one of the best barometers of community well-being, and that's our children. Um, I'm going to start with some basic demographics of our state. As you can see here in this slide, um, this is the total Illinois population by race, ethnicity. Uh, it's 12 million, close to 13 million. Uh, we have it broken down into four categories, uh, with white being the largest population, Latinx following thereafter, black, and then other. I want to explain the other category. Due to lack of detailed data for certain racial and ethnic categories, Asian, American Indian or Alaska Native or Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander or two or more races are grouped into one category as other non-Hispanic. We're hoping in future iterations of this report to be able to get um, a more precise read on our race, racial and ethnic groups in Illinois. 
The next slide I'm showing you is the breakdown for our state population of children age five and under by race, ethnicity. Um, roughly, we have 945,000, uh, close to 945, I mean 946,000. And so that kind of gives you a sense of how um, our population is bearing out by race, ethnicity. So moving along here, Starting with risk, this report is designed to show you risk. And I really want to emphasize it's not the individual risk, but it's the risk in the environment. I stress this because during the production of the report, the Advisory Council made a conscious decision to reject traditional uses of the word risk. You know, sometimes people use the phrase at risk children or at risk communities. We've decided to reframe the definition of risk to be situated in the environment and in structures because we believe that inherently no child is a risk, but children and families experience risk factors or barriers that undermine their development or ability to live up to their fullest potential. So this report will be looking at risk facing children by county and it's broken up into these three domains, family stability, health, early care and education. And as you can see throughout the report, we will be color coding these domains with family stability representing purple, health representing green, and early care and education representing that magenta or reddish color, depends on your color scheme. So what we have here are 15 risk factors. They were selected um, by the advisory council based on two criterion, um, or criteria. First, that child development research validated the indicator as producing conditions and circumstances that may compromise optimal child development. And second, availability of data at the county level. So we visualize these indicators in a blue heat map, meaning that the deeper the color of blue, the higher the concentration of risk factors. And throughout the report, we accompany maps with data tables so you can look at the number, the percentage, and risk category assigned to a county for a given indicator. So I am now going to orient you to our maps. Um, this one is representing maternal education. Um, specifically, it is um, percentage of births to moms age 20 and older with less than a high school education. So in the upper right corner, what you'll see in the report is the title of the indicator. You will notice that the counties are shaded in Erickson blue, depending on the concentration of the risk factor. The legend illustrates that the deeper the blue, the higher the prevalence of the risk factor in the environment. The bar on the right represents the numeric range of the risk and note that this is going to change for each indicator. And the maps also have state and national averages for each indicator when available. We were able to find this for all of our risk indicators, not so much a direct comparison with our national indicators. And in the footnotes within the report, you're gonna find that in some cases, we might have a proxy because the exact match was not available. So I'm gonna show you 15 maps like this and then an overall risk map, which we refer to as the composite. We're gonna cycle through these maps to help you understand the exposure to risk across the state. And specifically, don't worry about interpreting the maps. What I want you to pay attention to is how risk is not limited to one region of the state. It literally moves throughout the state depending on the risk factor. And at certain points, Dr. Tate is gonna chime in. Um, she has some thoughts about some of these uh, particular maps. But now that we've oriented you, I'm gonna get you through these 15 risk factors. So the next one is parental employment, and this is the percent of children age five and under with no parent in the labor force. The next one is poverty, and this is 100% of the federal poverty level. On our uh, website, you're gonna be able to also look at 50% as well as 200%. As you can see, the state average and national average are relatively close. 
Next is child care costs. That's the average child care cost as a share of median income. Can we stop for a second? Yes. So let's, can we go back to the child care costs? Absolutely. So I just um, want to uh, point out to people when you look at the maps, there are a couple of things that you can be looking for. And one of those is where you have a county that has a dark, dark blue or a medium dark blue, so it's either a high risk or a high moderate risk county that is directly adjacent to a county whose risk is much lower. So then that, that begs the question of why is it different when they're that close together? And so I just wanted to point this out because you can see it very well, for one thing, because we're all interested in child care costs, mm -hmm. which we all, all know are very high, but why would they be higher like, you know, literally in the next county. Um, and so what this is really causing us or enabling us to do is to look at these issues very locally and to have communities be able to look at this data on a very local community level and ask those questions for themselves, to call their partners and their collaborators in from the next county and talk about, well, I wonder why our childcare costs are so different for you than they are for me, and really drill down and find out what can be done about those things. So this kind of a, um, a view of the map uh, is really informative on a very local level. Thank you. So we're gonna move along looking at the housing cost map. This is representative of a housing cost burden. So um, the threshold is, is no more than 30% of a net income for a family income to be going towards housing costs. The next map is homelessness, and this is representative of just kindergarten students as reported to the McKinney-Vento liaisons in school districts. Um, we know just in general that homelessness is underreported, um, but we thought it was important to try to get a read um, on this from the vantage point of one of the more kind of centralized way that we collect information through the mckinney vento liaisons in school districts. Child maltreatment, this is representative of indicated reports of abuse or neglect per 1,000 children, zero to five, and Dr. Tate has a comment about this as well. Yes, I think this map is um, a particularly good example of the data challenging our assumptions about where certain phenomena occur, right? Because probably if uh, folks are having uh, conversations without data in front of them, they may not um, actually assume that the area uh, that includes Cook and the surrounding counties would actually be a low risk area relative to some of those counties that you see in dark blue in the middle of the state and some of those dark blue counties down at the southern tip of the state. And so I think this is again, um, uh, a really good example of how the data as demonstrated in these heat maps uh, can really challenge our assumptions. Right, and just to respond to a question, somebody had asked, do you include couch surfers in homelessness? That depends on how the McKinney-Vento liaison is applying the definition of homelessness. Um, there is a, a little bit of a broader definition um, that that are used in school districts um but it, it is completely incumbent upon the definition in which the liaison is using um, as they are reporting a family as homeless the next one is drug overdose deaths this is the number of overdose deaths and a rate per 100,000. I wanna just kinda highlight that this is a proxy. These are not just limited to parents of children zero to five. These are not just limited, these deaths, to parents. Um, but the advisory council felt that it was important to um, include this in the uh, selection of indicators because of the um, additional burdens that children may experience if they are being cared for by individuals with uh, substance use disorder um, that could at some point eventually lead to an overdose death. Next one is preterm births. These are births before 37 weeks. Next one is lead exposure. Um, I wanna note that although the data comes from um, 2016, 
in 2019, the state uh, lowered the threshold um, for lead exposure. And we applied that threshold to these data um, because we thought it would still be helpful in terms of making uh, this information actionable. Violence exposure is the rate of violent crimes per 100,000 people. Again, this is not um, related to just parents, but this is just more of a community violence measure. Kindergarten readiness, uh, this is not meeting the readiness thresholds, which is three of the four domains tested in school districts. And these data specifically come from the year 2017, 2018, um, that school year was the first year that all school districts had implemented the Kindergarten Individual Development Survey, which is our measure of kindergarten readiness. Then looking ahead to third grade proficiency, specifically in language arts, this is what it looks like for third graders not meeting or exceeding the um, standards established for proficiency. And the next one is related to math. Um, both of these, I must note, at some point um, may look a little different because these are using PARC data, which uh, this school year was the first year which there is a new assessment being used. It's based on the park. It's the, um, it's, it's the assessment of readiness um, uh, exam. And so the idea is that it may shift. And so uh, that's one thing that we don't have control over over time in terms of when um, different measures are presented in our state. But we wanted to at least get a read on third grade since we know how significant third grade is in terms of academic outcomes. So this is the composite map. And you know you had seen throughout the individual indicators, the colors change depending on the risk factors. And that gives you a more precise look at how these risk factors are playing out in every single county. Um, but this, the overall risk is an average of the 15 indicators and then divided by those 15 indicators. And that's what gives us what we call this composite map. But what I want to do to kind of give you uh, a better sense of the precision of data, we're going to look specifically at one uh, county, um, one that I'm sure you all are familiar with. Uh, it's not the perfect county to look at, but it also is to drive home the point that counties are blunt tools in terms of our geographies. Um, it's difficult for us to determine if there's one segment of the county that's driving the particular risk factors. Um, and so we want to be real intentional about messaging that it's super important that these data get interpreted at the local level and that they are contextualized by the local leadership. Um, and so I just think it's really important that, that you think about that as we're going through here. And Cook County on our website will be, um, we actually will do a deeper dive and we'll go sub-county for that because we know it's pretty big and it's also very diverse. But I'll just cycle through these, I won't say much, but just so you can see how shift and change depending on um, the particular risk factors. So homelessness, parental employment, child maltreatment, poverty, lead exposure, child care costs, housing costs, drug overdose deaths, maternal morbidity, preterm birth, violence exposure, kindergarten readiness, third grade proficiency, language arts, third, third grade proficiency in math, and overall risk. Kind of want to give you a little bit of what, how this all now plays out, a couple you know, key takeaways with respect to this. So this is how our overall counties break out, where we have a total of 102 counties. We have 15 of them registering in the low category. 36 in the low moderate, 39 in the high moderate, and 12 in the high. Want to highlight that our um, risk indicators are based on a relationship to the state average. 
So if you are um, essentially, if your county is rated higher than the state average, then you are falling into the high moderate and high risk. If your county is falling into the lower than state average of a particular indicator, you are in the low moderate and low risk categories. But really, you know, we want to start to think about this in terms of children. Um, where are the children in relationship to these categories? And it basically comes out to a little more than two thirds of the children that I had mentioned at the beginning of this webinar. So 643,768 are growing up in what we're calling high moderate, high risk counties risk being situated in the environment. And I think, uh, Christina, that's really an important uh, number and that's an important percentage for um, people to um, be aware of that uh, we're really, um, a lot of these um, issues that we're targeting, um, sometimes people have an idea, well, oh, that's really just affecting a few people, that's just affecting a few children. Well, we're, we're looking at a situation here where um, we've got 60% in high moderate and 8% of children in high. So taking those together, um, we're looking at Illinois children being, um, you know, at considerable, living in communities that present considerable risk to their development. Yes. So I'm going to get us to, you know, looking again, I've got some takeaways about the overall risk map. Um, We've got some good good news and some not so good news. Um, and this kind of might get at some of the questions that we've been receiving. One of them are any of the counties low risk for every indicator and were risk factors weighted in any way. No risk factors were not weighted in any way. And we know that that's a limitation. Um, but we also know that the compilation or the piling up of risk that children experience obviously undermines optimal child development. Um, so Thinking about these kind of key takeaways, 81% or 83 of the 102 counties rated as high risk on at least one indicator. 96% or 98 out of the 102 rated as high moderate risk. But on the flip side, 75% of high risk counties had at least two low or low moderate risk indicators. And so it's just kind of interesting to kind of look at our counties in that way. Essentially, all have strengths and all have opportunities for growth. And so one other point I want to make about this particular report, you know, Illinois is a build initiative state and we've spent the last year integrating a racial equity lens into the systems building work through our early learning council. And as such, we thought it would be important to include race ethnicity data when available per indicator to aid in understanding how different populations are experiencing risk factors. So this map, I didn't show you in the initial cycle of maps um, because it shows the rate of severe maternal morbidity per 10,000 deliveries. And just for those who are wondering, severe maternal morbidity includes unexpected outcomes of labor and delivery that result in significant consequences to a woman's health. Um, and maternal morbidity is a perfect case study for two reasons. You're going to notice that the majority of the state here is blanked out. There's no color um, in there indicating that there's no data. And because severe maternal morbidity is a rare outcome, data were only available at the county level for 18 out of the 102 counties. However, if it's such a rare outcome, it begs the question about why, when we disaggregate these data by race, ethnicity, it reveals that black moms are experiencing severe maternal morbidity at twice the state rate. So these data spark additional questions on the role of structural barriers and institutional racism that contributes to these con outcomes. And so in the report, you are going to find each one of these indicators, a breakdown of race ethnicity data in both risk and reach. Um, and if it's not available, we'll indicate in the note, but it can be a great way for us to have a deeper conversation about how we target resources and outreach and support that. 
And I think also it's really important when we uh, consider a slide like this and a, and a problem as severe as uh, maternal morbidity, um, that we really find out why it is that so much of the state lacks the data. So some of it is in is uh, obviously that the data collection mechanism isn't there, but we also understand part of it is in the uh, definition of severe, and so that the instance of uh, maternal morbidity doesn't rise to that level. So when when those two things are taken together and they produce a map that has all of this blank space, what that does is it it really hinders our ability to understand what is going on in most of the state in order to find solutions. So we would, you know, we would use this as an example of why it is important to both create the data mechanisms, the data collection me and reporting mechanisms, and also to define the indicators in a way where data can actually be produced so that you can actually learn something. Uh, so we don't have all this blank space. And, and this is a particularly good instance, of a sort of a really, you know, intense uh, portrayal of uh, the, the issues with the, our data collection. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to move us along to REACH. Um, we had 17 REACH indicators, and they were selected by the Advisory Council based on two criteria. Um, one, it, that they are representative of a policy lever, and therefore we can be action-oriented with this, these data. And two, that they correlate with mitigating the selected risk factors in the previous section. So we're going to take you through just a few examples for the sake of brevity to try to um, be able to keep everybody on and with getting through all the information. Um, so the, the first one I'm going to look at with you all is the high quality um, child care. And here in Illinois, through our Accelerate, which is our quality rating and improvement system, we are defining high quality through the gold circle of care. Um, again, REACH is representative of the services and the supports that the state provides to mitigate the, the risk and it excludes local investments. So this is not gonna be representative of the local contribution. So in our REACH maps, the map, the base map is always going to be the overall risk. And then the service is overlaid on that map and the dots represent the level of reach. I want to point out that the smallest dot represents no service or 0% reach. So this is a great map to look at in terms of the mismatch between risk and reach in certain communities. So <clears throat> well, I can't see the name of that particular community on, in the middle of the state on the far right hand side. Is that familiar? Mm -hmm. is a uh, community that's very uh, dark blue, right? So very high risk. And look at the size of the dots, very small. So when, when you see that, that's where we know we have a mismatch. The, the, community, the community right above Vermilion, again, we have a mismatch there. And so that's where we go to um, community level conversations about um, you know, what's going on in those communities in terms of participation in high quality childcare. But in addition, we have to raise the question statewide because we have a statewide average of only 15% of children receiving uh, CCAP enrolled in Gold Circle quality programs. Then what is our responsibility at the state level to make um, high quality child care um, more available and accessible to um, more children receiving CCAP? So there's got to be a state level strategy and local level strategy simultaneously. That's right. Um, and so what we've circled here is just representative of different ways to look at these data and ignite these conversations. Because ultimately, you know, we're not trying to, as Erickson Institute, tell communities what they should be doing and what the state should be doing, but essentially using these data to spark conversations and to ignite action about how to address the solutions locally. We are firm believers that the wisdom is in the room and those closest to the problems should be the ones helping to solve those problems. The next map I wanna um, point out is mental health services. We were just delighted that we were able to secure um, these data and I want to point out that it's the percent of children age five and under who received mental health services 
through all kids, which is our state Medicaid um, program. What you'll notice is that the biggest circle is a max of 26%. I'm going to point out that, you know, I see Warren, Knox, Fulton, Vermilion County with elevated risk with at least some services or Franklin down south um, with high risk and high services or up north by a uh, discrepancy and um, you know, you start to ask what is going on here. So I'm just showing you a few examples out of these reach, um, but we have others, as I mentioned before in the, in the table. And the other thing I wanna just kind of note overall, the state average of reach is 5.9%. So just uh, just a final note on the mental health services um, for young children. Um, you know, th this is an area in which we really have been, um, a number of people have been looking at know um, that the um, emotional stability and the social and emotional growth of children um, in the first five years is really critical. And if things are off track, um, children are developing um, issues that will later result in more significant mental health um, issues, then we've missed the window if we haven't intervened. So the fact that we only are intervening at, at about 5% of the children is um, really something that we uh, really should be concerned about. We got a question actually on the um, high quality child care about why we chose a 24 to 79% spread. It's a pretty large spread. Eric Wang, Dr. Wang is going, uh, he's specifically um, addressing the response through the chat box. Um, so we will read that in a moment. I just want to continue to get us through. Um, here's our home visiting map and I just want to acknowledge that these are, um, these are uh, program eligible children ages five and under enrolled in a home visiting program. Um, and so you can see here that the range is 5.6% and we have some places where, you know, we have um, higher risk registering in the categories and higher reach. And then you have others where you have two counties adjacent to each other, category, but limited reach. Again, begging that question. Um, we also have an early intervention map which is showing the reach, the percent of children age two and under. So that's two years, 11 months, because children age out at, at one, on their third birthday with early intervention. And you know, you'll know, you see here that we have a spread of moderate high risk individual, or I'm sorry, counties and very limited reach. And you'll notice actually the, there's a dot that doesn't, it's not shaded, that indicates that there's no service um, in those counties. Yet we see in other examples that I just um, circled, we have, you know, the moderate and then we have a larger reach. But like, again, let's look at this reach. Our state average is 4.5%. Mm -hmm. And this is also an area in which we should um, be attentive to the opportunity that we have in the governor's requested budget. Um, Seven million additional dollars were requested for early intervention, and so we, it, it seems incumbent upon us to make sure that they go uh, to the communities that have low reach at this point in time. So moving along to the fiscal scan, we're going to just give you um, a quick kind of overview at the in the report at the end of each. Um, domain, you family stability, health, early care, and education, summary of the fiscal scan with the budget lines associated with those domains. So this chart here represents the state's total operating budget in fiscal year 18, and it is a total of 63 billion. That's the total pie, and then what we see here is that 4.9% goes to families with young children age five and under. I wanna just note we chose the fiscal year 18 because fiscal year 16 and 17, we didn't have a budget. 
and we decided to go with the most recent year where we had estimated expenditures as of January 1st, 2019. Um, the full fiscal scan actually gives you an analysis of fiscal year 15 through fiscal year 19 appropriation. So you can start to see some trends. So looking at just that 4.9% plus some other direct federal to local entities, so that would be SNAP, the Supplementary Nutrition Assistance Program, which those dollars come straight from the Fed to families, and Head Start, Early Head Start, which goes directly to providers, and that totals about $754 million. If you add that $754 million with that $3.127 billion from the last slide, you have total spending of $3.8 billion. And this is how that $3.8 billion breaks out by the three domains in our report. And we can't say what the of the slice is, you know, should be, but now we actually know what it is. And essentially, I want to take you an example to peel back the layers. We're going to look at just a breakdown of healthcare expenditures. So, when we look at our healthcare expenditures, we can now see that it's broken up into three different categories healthcare and family services, which is nearly 75%. Um, representing $1.3 billion, nutrition and maternal and child health. Now, if we break down that healthcare and family services, we're now going to be looking at the categorical expenditures underneath that. And you can see here, we've got all kids and moms and babies. Moms and babies is the medical, um, the Medicaid program for women while pregnant and for 60 days afterwards, and all kids is the Medicaid, um, the Illinois, the state Medicaid program for eligible children up to age 18. But what this represents is the children zero to five under all kids. Well, when we start to peel back all kids, we can see what those expenditures are. And so this is a breakdown um, of the expenditures for children age five and under a little over a billion dollars. I want to point out, since we were just talking about mental health, we can see here that 2.8% of Medicaid expenditures for children zero to five is for mental health. And that actually, if we go back to this whole piece here, when we're thinking about total spending for families, it's less than 1% of the total spending for families with children five and under. And so again, I just want to really, you know, point out that we can't say what this distribution should be, but now we actually know what is happening. The scan is going to give you a full out um, breakdown of all of these areas and expenditures, but you'll get the summary in the report. And so I want to just quickly highlight our interactive website. I'm going to click on here and take us over there. Um, because there will not only be a paper um, or, or a hard copy of the report, there will also be a um, interactive website where you can toggle between counties and legislative districts. You can download one pagers that give you a summary. You can um, in, in future versions, you'll be able to mix and match different risk and reach indicators. For now, you'll just be able to look at the, um, the ones in which we have here. And so I'm going to bring my screen over here so you can see. And um, on this particular website, we've got an about page that kind of gives you the breakdown of what the report is, who was involved, all a list of our advisory council. We also have here, um, this is where you can actually go back and forth with the risk factors. And so you'll see here, similar to our um, report, we've got a breakdown where you'll see what the risk factor is, the title. Um, it has an explanation, so which is akin to the narrative and the copy in the report. And then you'll actually be able to hover and look at each of the counties. 
see what is the number of this we're looking at maternal education and what is the percent um, these are the percentages of births to mothers age 20 and over without a high school um, education and what the risk level was assigned to that below bottom you'll be able to see the actual table and you can sort through all of the different counties you can search by county um, you can filter there's a variety of ways that you can play with these data I'm going to just give you a quick look see what reach looks like under this particular indicator um, so we can look at now let's say income assistance and we know income assistance represents TANF the temporary assistance for needy families and so again hovering over a particular county you can see the number of families with children zero to five that receive this the percentage what the reach level is and the risk level so i'm going to just return us back here to our slides because i just have some Key messages I want to walk I want to leave you with and then we can open up to some additional questions that we may not have addressed thus far so I think the first is that this report is really about breaking assumptions you know as and we see risk factors in the environment all throughout the state and in some places that we wouldn't expect because of the narratives that we have in our mind about particular geographies within our states or even about particular populations but all of this really calls for deeper conversations with key stakeholders we see four key stakeholders that need to be in conversations inclusive of beneficiaries those who benefit from these resources philanthropy policymakers and program leaders that's why it's so important that the local context needs to inform solutions and that they not just be surface solutions when you see one county with a high risk low reach and you see the adjacent county with the opposite relationship and say well let's just take resources from this county and apply it here that actually can make circumstances and situations worse but that's why it calls for a deeper conversation contextualizing these data so that you are making more effective decisions and equitable decisions with relation to resources and allocations so because we are firmly anchored in this message of needing to have conversations around these data, we have come up with a series of questions that can aid you in your data discussions. The first being, and in the report, there's several other follow-up questions, but these are meant to ignite the conversations that will inspire action. And we really want you to pay attention to what stands out in a map. What patterns do you see across indicators for a given county? Can connections be made by looking at different combinations of indicators? And which ones call more attention? What is happening in the county or region that might explain trends? Does this indicator present a regional or pocketed problem? And what other questions do these data arise? Or these data raise, sorry. So I just want to close us with, you know, thinking about how informative this information can be for the first time in Illinois. And the questions now, the more specific and precise questions we can make about how we better serve children's and families in our communities. And before we didn't know, so now we at least have a baseline and this is great information to bring to our policy leaders and our elected officials, but it's incumbent upon all of us to make meaning of it, to contextualize it, to be ambassadors of these data. They all require us to weigh in so that we don't have some of these um, situations where people are just kind of applying blanket um, solutions or surface solutions. Um, I see that I have, and I'm going to just close this out here. This is our website, and you can send us a note. Um, I have a question here about how we can access this webinar. We are going to be posting this on our website. 
Um, and I want to just let everybody know, since you registered for the webinar, you will be able to receive a note from us of when the report is up on our website, when the website is available for you to um, play with the data. So um, make sure that you, you know, look out for that email. We'll be sending it along next week. Are there any other questions in the chat box that we need to address? One question earlier, I just want to make sure I got the answer in. So why did we choose a 29% range? That's a huge spread. Um, and the response is data class ranges are determined by the standard deviation method. A large spread of class ranges means that the data for that indicator has a fairly large standard deviation amount of variation of all the county values. So for the data geeks, I hope that that helps um, Dr. Tate, are there any closing uh, thoughts that you have? Uh, yes, just one thing, um, and that is as we consider the conversations that um, would be sparked by looking at this data, um, I feel like one of the really important conversations for state administrators, my colleagues, and, uh, and the state lawmakers, and all of those who are involved in making resource allocation decisions is that how do we actually um, assure that when we uh, make decisions about resource allocation that um, the risks faced by the children in the communities that we're planning for are taken in and uh, uh, giving us, this will really give us a great opportunity to talk about how we um, allocate resources, how we achieve equity uh, in the allocation of our resources and, um, you know, once we begin those conversations, I, I think that there will be, this will make a really significant contribution to that decision making. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, once again, I'd like to shout out our amazing data Illinois Early Childhood Asset Map at the University of Illinois and the Fiscal Policy Center at Voices for Illinois Children, as well as funders for making this entire project possible. We look forward to seeing you in the communities. We look forward to hearing about how you're using this data and how we can support you in that effort. Stay tuned for the next webinar, which will be April 30th with Illinois Action for Children S3, that is the Community Statewide Systems of Support project. Um, we will specifically be tailoring that webinar for our community collaboratives across the state to be able to dive into data. And we are signing out here at Erickson Institute.